What's going on everybody? Brad here and I'm in my kitchen now because I'm gonna show you how to make coffee. I'm kidding. I'm actually replacing the CPU in my computer and I needed a big workspace so the kitchen table. So basically I figured I'd have you guys tag along. Uh, we'll talk about some stuff, what I do to swap out a CPU and a computer, what it's like using a 3900 XT Ryzen processor in a B450 motherboard, and we're gonna kind of go over some benchmarks near the end and see what kind of performance gains we get coming from my Ryzen 5 2600. Sound good? Let's get started. Now, before we dive in and get started with everything, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing if you haven't done so already, as I post new home theater and gaming related content every single week. Also, if you'd like to help support the channel for free, there's some Amazon affiliate links in the description below and I get a small commission from those. It really helps me out if you use those and I appreciate it so much. So with all that said, let's go ahead and jump in. I'll show you what I got and we'll get started. So as I said, I've been using the Ryzen 5 2600 CPU uh, for about a year now. It's a great little CPU. I grabbed it when it was on sale for about $100 fifteen dollars last year that's got six cores 12 threads does a really nice job with video editing and gaming but as I started getting into more 3d rendering and things that are really CPU intensive I decided it's time for an upgrade and so I grabbed the Ryzen 9 3900 XT for the price of a Ryzen 9 3900 X and the reason I went with that is I know the Ryzen 5000 series just launched uh, you can't find them anywhere currently I'm rocking the MSI B450 Tomahawk the regular edition not the max edition uh, it does have some of the best VRMs of any B450 board that has come out ever. Uh, so it should handle this chip just fine, but I didn't see a lot of videos about it, so that's why I'm making this one. But I didn't want to upgrade that motherboard right away, so I decided to just grab the chip now, put it in the motherboard, and then maybe sometime next year grab like an X570 board or something like that. So as you can see here, I have the Arctic Freezer 33 CPU air cooler, and I was using that with the Ryzen 5 2600 for basically the whole year that I had it, and it's been rock solid, great temps. I didn't overclock the chip, so there wasn't anything to worry about there. But, uh, you know, going up to 12 cores, 24 threads, it's a little concerned about uh, overall temperatures because I know the Ryzen 3000 series likes to run hot and use a little bit of voltage. So I wanted to stick with air because I'm not really a big fan of water cooling. Uh, and so I went with the Scythe Fuma 2. And the reason I went with that is I was originally going to go with the Noctua DH15. I know I'm forgetting some numbers in there. The problem was uh, the RAM clearance issues with that cooler. I don't know if you can see in there. Yeah, it's just not going to work. And also the length of it was about three and a half millimeters too far out this way. So I would probably not be able to use a side panel. So I went with this and you know what? I might change my mind eventually and go with an air cool, uh, water cooler. Uh, but you know, for now, uh, this is gonna work just just fine. I actually installed it on the Ryzen 5 2600 uh, before I did the benchmark. So we have like for like comparisons with the same air cooler and not, you know, this one versus that one. That's not what this video is about. I just wanted them to be like for like. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna Lock the camera off on a tripod. As you can see, I got my phone up here, so we're gonna record some overhead footage of me working on the computer, and I'll talk over some stuff, and we'll go over a few things while I'm installing the CPU, and then I'll come back and let you know what I had to change or if I had to do anything in the BIOS to get the 3900 XT to play nicely with the B450 Tomahawk, and we'll go over some benchmarks and see what kind of gains we get. So let's go ahead and get started replacing the CPU, but first, we gotta remove this guy, so let's get to it. So to get started, we obviously need to take the side panel off to detach the CPU cooler fans because I routed the fan splitter to get it out of the way for a cleaner look. And wow, look at that excellent wire management, huh? Anyway, I really do like the way the Scythe Fuma 2 fans mount onto the cooler and it makes it pretty easy to take them off and on once you figure out how the clips work. But the clips can be a bit of a pain to get to with the cooler installed in the case. Now removing the heatsink is super easy and can be done with the fan still installed, but since the fan cables were routed to the back, it was just easier to remove those first. I do use an IC graphite thermal pad instead of paste. It's super easy to work with and temps are typically within two to three degrees of the Arctic MX4 paste that I used previously. Okay, I just realized that my phone for whatever reason did not record me taking out the 2600 and putting the 3900 XT in, but it's pretty self-explanatory. You just lift up the little lever, take the old one out, put the new one in, and then I screwed the air cooler back on. So really it just, the reverse process of what you saw me taking the air cooler off was. So sorry about that. And thanks iPhone 12 Pro. Don't you just love when technology works? 
Anywho, we got the 2600 out and replaced it with the 3900 XT, which went in without a hitch as expected. Since the thermal pad is reusable, I just put that back on and even though I didn't use paste with the Scythe Fuma 2, I do like to clean the heat spreader with isopropyl alcohol and dry it with a coffee filter just to make sure there's nothing on it before mounting it. Like I mentioned before, the fans do take a bit of work to get them onto the heat sink when working with it inside the case. And yeah, I realized afterwards that the front slim fan was crooked and went ahead and straightened that off camera. And in case you're wondering what case I'm using, <laughs> get it? I'll stop, I'm sorry. It's the Fantex P400A, and I really like the design, look, and overall airflow of this case. It makes wire management super easy, and I definitely think it's one of the better cases you can build a system in. And here we are a couple days later, and everything is running great. Temps are great. I didn't really have to do much in the BIOS. I did a couple things, and I'll, I'll walk you through that. But I did want to say that I updated the BIOS before I installed the 3900 XT, so we mitigate any issues with that there. But again, everything's been pretty rock solid. Now, let's go ahead and just jump in. I'll go over everything I did, and then we'll look at some benchmarks. All right, so we're in the overclocking tab here in the MSI BIOS, and you'll see right away, I haven't really done much in here at all. If I go under advanced CPU configuration right here, you'll notice I just have precision boost overdrive set to auto, that's actually off. So if I go in here, you'll see a bunch of different modes here, enabled enhanced mode, one, two, three, four, uh, even eco modes. So if you are not really utilizing the full chip to the, you know its potential, then you know, you could use one of the eco modes. Now I did do a couple of tests and honestly what I saw from using Precision Boost Overdrive and Auto OC wasn't really worth it for the overall temperature increase. I wasn't getting a ton more performance. You know, my, my Cinebench scores were going up by 20 or 30 points, so which is negligible. Uh, that's kind of honestly margin of error. What I will say is all the benchmarks that you're gonna see coming up were done with Enhanced Mode 2. So that's Precision, Boost Overdrive, and Auto OC of a 200 megahertz overclock, uh, which, you know, is not really 200 megahertz. It really just depends on what's going on with the CPU, you know, what what's the current voltage it's drawing, what's the temperature at, you know, things like that. It's gonna take that into account. So I'm just gonna leave it off. Now, I will say that the temperature went up about 10 degrees Celsius if, I, if I'm if i using uh, Enhanced Mode 2, which is a lot. Um, I didn't really try undervolting too much uh, because with the way Ryzen works, you can actually make performance worse if you don't do it properly. So uh, I'm not really gonna go with, down that road. But for now, I'm just gonna use Auto, which is disabled. Uh, and if I go back here, uh, you're gonna see the only other thing I did was I enabled the Profile 2 on my XMP, which is now running at 3200 megahertz. And then I adjusted the frequency clock for the memory to 1600 megahertz, which uh, you want that to be half of 3200, 1600. And if we go down here, uh, you'll notice I left pretty much everything on auto with the exception of two things. I set the DRAM voltage manually to 1.35 volts instead of you know just letting it do auto, which it set it to about 1.42 volts, which was a little high to me. I, I wasn't really comfortable with that and the other thing that I set manually was the North Bridge and or SOC voltage and I set that to 1.1 just really quick because again if I left it on auto and enabled XMP it wanted to go up to 1.21 volts which honestly 1.2 volts is the max that I'm comfortable with that's actually the max I think you're you're supposed to you know like go by uh, so I just quickly just put it back to 1.1 I could probably go lower and I might you know tinker around with the Ryzen DRAM calculator at some point and try to get the best timings for my memory that I possibly can. And the only other thing I did was I went in and I adjusted some fans uh, settings like the step up and step down time. I readjusted because the 3900 XT or all 3000 series chips, especially on air, fluctuate a ton when at idle. You know, I'm going from, you know, 42C, which is about, you know, my average temp at idle to 55C sometimes, you know, just depending on what's going on. And you'd hear those fluctuations like really rapidly. So I just went in and I adjusted those to the max values here. Um, as you can see, I, I can't go higher than, you know, 0.7 seconds on the step up time and the, you know, one second on the step down time. You know, for whatever reason, I was trying to set three second, you know, things like that, but I couldn't do it. So. Uh, this actually just is really, really quiet, especially at idle. Uh, even under full load, there's not a lot going on. And 
it's keeping it relatively cool, you know, 72, 73 C, which is only about 10 degrees higher than my Ryzen 5 2600 with the Arctic Freezer 33. So I'm really happy with that. Now, uh, let's go ahead and get out of here. We'll go over some benchmarks. You'll see what kind of gains I got in games and, you know, rendering stuff. And we'll wrap up this video. So now that we've gone over all those benchmarks, you know, you saw the performance gains and they weren't very much in, in many of the games, most of the games actually. And the reason for that is most games don't really take advantage of multiple threads. Games like Zombie Army 4 and stuff like that already run at a pretty high frame rate. And honestly there, the bottleneck is my GPU. Uh, and most of the games, the bottleneck is the GPU. But the games that are multi-threaded or take you know more advantage of multiple threads, such as Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Far Cry New Dawn, uh, we did see some pretty decent gains. I think Far Cry New Dawn was like 15 frames per second more on average than you know it was before on the 2600. And then Assassin's Creed Odyssey again, you know, we saw a, an uptick, you know, from about 10, 10 to 11 frames, I think. That's really, really great. And I'm hoping with the next gen consoles, the Series X and the PS5, and even the Series S, uh, we're gonna start seeing more games take advantage of more threads. And that's only gonna benefit everybody you know, console gamers and PC gamers. We should start seeing improvements on the PC side of gaming because of that. Now, the biggest upgrade obviously was in the multi-core rendering performance for productivity tasks such as, you know, Premiere and Cinema Bench or Cinema 4D. Uh, that's the 3D program I use. Even After Effects, I've noticed, a, a, you know, an, an increase in overall performance and, uh, you know, at points where I need to render something to RAM just to preview it, it, it's much, much faster. So definitely worth the upgrade. Now, would I upgrade to this just for gaming? No, no, I, I probably wouldn't. I would go with something like the Ryzen 7 3800X or the 3700X. Um, you could look at the new, the new chips as well if you can find them. And we should see some decent Black Friday deals on the Ryzen CPUs coming up. So if you're in the market, Definitely try to hold off. Uh, I got the Ryzen 9 3900 XT for a really good price. Like I said, the price of a 3900X. So I really couldn't pass it up. And it's gonna be my go-to CPU for the next, you know, two to three years, most likely, unless, you know, some company starts sending me CPUs to review or something, then, then I'll probably start using those. But anyway, if you enjoyed this video and found it helpful at all, please give it a big thumbs up. It lets me know that you appreciate this type of content. Also, if you have any questions about any of the benchmarks that I posted, home theater or gaming in general, please leave a comment down below and let me know. Thank you everyone for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.